Welcome to the Builders Coach Show. My name is Kurt Hagenschwiller. I'm the founder of Builders Coach and we're going to have a different show today. It's our 20-year anniversary and Jess, what have we got in store? Yes, so we've got two special episodes. So guys, watch this one and then watch out for the next one too um, because this month, October 2024, is your 20 years as a business coach. Yes, Kurt. unbelievable. Two decades. Time flies when you're having fun. Indeed. So... What we're going to do in this episode is just go through a bit some lessons learned and some questions and hopefully dig into some really good stories about yeah. all the, the clients that you had over the last 20 years. How much time do we have? I've got some stories, man. <laughs> okay, 20 years, huge mm-hmm. milestone, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you first get into business coaching specifically for builders? What drew you to that industry? Well, I started out um, doing a very intelligent thing, by the way, um, not knowing much about business. And buying a franchise. I bought a franchise license. Not many people know this. A lot of my private clients, I tell them, I purchased a business coaching franchise license. I coached 100 businesses in my first three years. A fair percentage were builders. I gravitated towards builders because my dad was a tradesman. And I was getting great results with them. I also realized that there was um, a desperate need for business coaching in the building industry. But guys, there are a lot of good people doing things the long, hard, difficult way. and Although they knew most of them, at least, how to build, they didn't know much about running a business, the marketing, sales, admin, finance, all that sort of thing. I thought I'd put my flag in the sand and niche in uh, building uh, business coaching for builders. Awesome. Yes. Niching. That's exactly what you exactly, teach your yeah. uh, clients also. Which, right? funnily enough, we were, we were teaching niching uh-huh. under this franchise, but we weren't practicing it. So we were generalist coaches. So I was coaching retail stores, you know, plumbers, electricians, builders, bakeries. Yeah. One of my best clients was a baker, actually, fantastic guy from, from Europe. And we weren't really walking the talk. And I went over to the US, like I'm a seminar junkie. I just, I love consuming books and seminars and um, content from the right mentors. And, um, you know, I remember flying back on the plane and I, and I decided that's it. I'm going to launch Builders Coach. Keep it simple. So now thinking of the um, building industry, um, how have you seen the industry evolve over the last 20 years? I imagine that the, the issue or challenges that you had back then might have been a little bit different than what we're seeing right now. Yes and no. So, you know, the one thing that hasn't changed is human nature. But mm-hmm. yes, the world's changing and rapidly, right? So the last five years, three years, there's been significant change, especially with systems, technology, the number of competitors that have come into play, obviously with artificial intelligence, chat GPT, how that's impacted marketing. So there's a lot of positive change in my view, very positive, but you know, your business will never outgrow your leadership. And that's the one area that hasn't changed. You know, guys getting clear on what they want, you know, setting clear goals, people management, building a strong team, which is still possibly the single most powerful thing you can do is is building a strong team of competent people ensures business success. And then, uh, you know, obviously keeping those people. And, and, and in this day and age, moving with the times, things are changing so quickly. Back in 2015, we ran our first paperless event. So it was possible to run a building company completely paperless for the first time. Yeah. And I remember kicking that event off, talking about how systems set you free, and they do. Systems do set you free. But something that we realized back then, it's, it's fascinating. That's already, that's nine years ago. Your system for updating your systems is more important than your system. I remember communicating that back then. So that's just gone on an upward sort of trajectory, uh, parabolic change since then with systems and technology. So a lot of people now are sort of running full tilt, trying to keep up to date with all the changes just to stay in the same place. So there's that, but there are certain fundamentals that are you know, still exactly the same, like your break-even point is mm-hmm. your break-even point. Um, using forecasting um, with your financials and, and again, people management, mm. employing on attitude over skill, which we've spoken about. So looking at your like private clients over the last 20 years, if you had to name your top three or their top three challenges, That's I fine. know you mentioned lead- leadership yeah. and mindset. Mm-hmm. If you had like a top three, what are some of the recurring things that you can see with your clients? Great question. Like I've worked with over a thousand builders one-on-one over the past 20 years, the number one thing without a doubt would be mindset. 
you know, 70% of success is mindset and I spend so much time. If you've been to any of my live events, you hear me talk about how I'm consistently telling people to get out of their own way. And um, I remember when I started my coaching, I got trained over in the US with that franchise organization and there were great presenters there. They got their best coaches in front of us. And one of the guys was the CEO of the organization, of the franchise organization. He owned five businesses. He was at the back end of his career, like late 50s. And he said the number one thing he had learned in business was that the only thing stopping him from achieving anything mm-hmm. was him. That that was the one thing that really stood out as his number one learning. And, and I found that to be true. It really is. So that would be right up there. Financials is a big one. Like I say, a thousand clients. I have not had one, or well, at least cannot remember one mm-hmm. who has come to me. And I've had at least three or four that have you know, come to us already in that seven-figure club. So, net in a million bucks uh, over a 12-month period off all expenses, including wages to sell. They did not have their financial controls accurate. Mm. And, and nice and clean and clear where they could push a button and, you know, generate a profit and loss on a job and tell me their break-even point and their gross margin. Yeah. Those financial controls, that's always a sticking point for guys. And then if that's a go third, you know, say marketing, you need to market 10 times more than you think you do and of course, you know, we've spoken about it at nauseum. You need to niche, you need to specialize, be a cardiologist, not a GP. That gives you market p- penetration and more relevance to a market. Relevance is key with marketing and marketing is all about communication. So having a relevant message that you set to, you know, send and present to a select group of people is so important for any business. So those would be three off the top of my head. But then, you know, once you un- start unpacking those, there's a lot of complexity within that, which is why one on one coaching is so important. It's not about information, right? Because we live in the information age. If, if it was about information, just having information to be successful, then everyone would be a billionaire with six-pack abs. Um, it's, it's not like that. It's not a pain by numbers thing. Everyone's different and every business is different as well. Can you share with us one of your best success story from one of your clients? Is this someone that stands out and you really remember? Wow, that was so like a, such, such a good success story. So, so many. So, close to 100 in the seven-figure club. Four of them got there within three years of starting their business. Yeah. The ones I love most, and again, there's so many, would be, I'll give you an example. Um, so the young guy came to me, you about half a mil turnover, just him and an apprentice. Okay. Three years later, he's in the seven-figure club. In his 20s, so 29, 30, he does high-end architectural builds. So any young guys watching, they'll know that it's difficult because buildings – geographical right like you unless you're a national builder or volume builder which our clients aren't right most are turning over between two and ten million yes are small businesses they work in a certain area like yeah it'd be the northern beaches or even just manly and the, mm-hmm. the lower north shore if you're a young guy starting out and you're building high-end architecture builds your biggest challenge is how do you compete against the silver foxes right so the older guys mm. that have been building for 25 years that have maybe won awards and they brand new they built one project maybe or maybe they're trying to break in they haven't done their first big project yet and there's so many stories like this, man. but this guy was able to break through and um want a job against an older builder with a 25 year portfolio of work mm-hmm. um, and that was the guy that he did his apprenticeship with oh, okay. and the older guy was just like was fuming you know it was like a cult volcano just steaming like how does this young guy why why would someone give a two million dollar project and that responsibility over to a 29 year old that's just insane right but that young guy was professional organized process driven proactive communication and that alone was enough to give the client all the confidence they needed so i've got mm-hmm. like endless stories like that there's another guy also young different location also doing sort of similar turnover and was able to you know penetrate the market and he came up against one of the best builders in the country mm-hmm. so you know was here in sydney late 20s early 30s sitting in front of a client who's worth 700 million dollars you know this guy's buying two eight million dollar properties demolishing them building a house he doesn't even live in sydney he lives in another part of australia but he's going to entertain clients and this young guy went in he said to this guy if i work with you on this project at the end of the job on, when I'm handing this house over to you, what would have to have happened during the build and with the end result for you to want to introduce me to everyone on your roller decks? And uh, he was there with a client. The client's wife was there. So, this, you know, the guy's almost a billionaire and um, the architect mm-hmm. as well. And one open-ended question, this guy went for about 24 minutes. Mm. 
just saying, well, this is, you have to do this, da, 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 and this guy was just taking notes. Mm. And they walked away and the architect looked at him and said, where did you get that question from? Mm. And he ended up getting the job. Yeah, and th- th- those sorts of stories, yeah, getting goosies, I absolutely love it. There's more, but I'll stop there. Mm. So, Kurt, you wrote a book, Million Dollar Builder. Guys, if you still don't know about this book, please <laughs> comment below and we'll send it to you. We'll give out a free copy um, to, to any of our uh, listeners. Absolutely. So, Million Dollar Builder, how mm-hmm. did it come about? Why did you write the book? I came out to Australia from South Africa in 2001. I did not know anyone. I literally did not know a single person in this country. I came out on my own. I had one phone number. My uncle, who now sadly passed away, he gave me the phone number of a friend that he grew up with who he hadn't seen for decades, who he knew was living in Sydney. Um, I called him as a last resort just to try and, you know, make contact with someone. I was in a backpackers for the first six weeks down at Bondi Beach, which was, which was good fun. But I didn't know much. I, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know who to trust. I was sort of seeking information, mentors. I was reading lots of books. I was going to seminars. And I found that a lot of these, these seminars and a lot of people in, in, in books and that were, that were presenting information back then, it was like they'd tell you the what but not the how. And it was like a bait and switch. They're trying to lure you in. And then sell you into a program or a course and that, you know, I was just left more confused than ever before. But, you know, seeking you shall find. So I kept looking and seeking and I found people Mm -hmm. whose business philosophy was to give away the farm, to share everything they had learned. Mm -hmm. And these are largely older guys, right? And that, that they were open. They were just, and you know, you get a sense when you can trust someone. In the same moment, you're talking to someone and you, and you feel like they're, they're bullshitting. And you mm-hmm. can just, you know, they're saying all the right things, but you get a funny feeling in your gut. And then the opposite when someone's authentic and honest. And, and um, these guys were like, hey, man, I've learned so much over my career. I just want to share. That's my marketing strategy. Is I'm going to share everything that I have that works. I'm going to tell you what and how to do it. Mm-hmm. And look, if you can take it and use it and you never ever work with me, fine. But I know from test and measure that a percentage of people, after looking at that my content, mm-hmm. they will realize that I'm authentic, I know what I'm talking about, and then we'll get clients. Yeah. And I remember there was a moment in time where I was like, I want to be that guy because, like, I'm not going to tear up. But, like, the fact that a stranger was able to share information that really helped transform my life right? like, and, and my family's life with everything I've learned, I think just phenomenal. And, again, I just wanted to be that guy that does that. So 90% of the people that we help, I never get to meet, mm-hmm. you know, and I can tell you, I've had guys walk up to me at an event where I'm doing a keynote speaking gig or something and the guy's like, hey, you changed my life. Mm-hmm. And he walks away, shakes my hand. I, I don't know who he is. I don't know his name. I've never, I haven't seen him again since. Yeah. But to know that I've had that impact is just freaking awesome. And that drives me to do more. So mm-hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, in a unique position where I, I get to enjoy what I do. I'm, I'm happy with the money I make. Mm-hmm. And I'm living a flow lifestyle. I get into flow state when I coach. Like it's, uh, you know, athletes talk about flow state where you lose yeah. all sense of self and time. So, um, yeah, I love it. But um, I forgot the question. <laughs> what was the qu- <laughs> Why did I write the book or yes. something to do with the book? Right now. Yeah, why did you write the why book? I write? Yeah, I just mm-hmm. wanted to share everything I knew and, and help people. And but that's actually quite heartwarming to know that inside all of us, deep down, mm-hmm. we all have a desire to want to help other people. Other people. Uh, yeah, this is awesome. What's a client story that uh, really inspired you? Something maybe that uh, you learned from one of your clients or it inspired your journey? Yeah. I've got one from yesterday. Oh. That's how it is. Freaking unbelievable. Like goosebumps. I was talking to you about it earlier today off air, right? So this guy, he, um, regional builder, small town. Imagine it's the same in the US, in the UK, in, you know, out in the country or, any small town, like most people don't have big aspirations. They don't want to, you know, conquer the world and be the next Elon Musk. They just want to provide for their family, you know, get a nice house, yeah. make sure the kids go to good schools, you know, that sort of thing. So, and, and that's the case. Like Australia is a big middle class community. This guy's Australian builder. And um, I got him to expand his thinking because your business will never outgrow your leadership and you'll never outperform your aspirations, right? If you decide, you know, you just want to, Play here, yeah, then you're not going to go up there. You know, if you want to go beyond there, you've got to set higher expectations, raise the bar, and everything you do is about raising standards, essentially, right? Mm-hmm. So I got chatting to this guy about that, and, and he did that. He expanded his view, and, and it sparked something in him. 
where he was like, hey, man, why don't I have a crack? And seven-figure club, I could do that, set up a development arm and, you know, keep going. And he set a goal. He's got three girls. I've got four girls. He's got three. And he was like, I want to, I'm going to build my business um, and, and structure it and set it up so it's so successful that they're not going to want to leave. It's going to be so attractive to them. I'm going to be having so much fun, making so much money that they will – Yeah, and if they don't, that's fine, but I at least want to have a crack at setting it up so that it's so attractive to them that they could work in it and he'd make it uh, – set it up in a way that if they – you know, kids are different, they've got different skill sets. And, yeah. Submetric profile. If they wanted to get in the sales, they could get in the sales, building a real estate, architecture, building, whatever it is. Yeah. And, you know, his, his kids are all under the age of 10, not three of them, right? Mm-hmm. So there was that. He also, you know, keen to set up the development arm, like I said, and he was looking at real estate online and you can bring up properties for sale and then you can filter through and it's the lowest price to the highest price. You yeah. always look at the lowest price to the highest price. And after we had a coaching call, he went highest price to lowest price. And there were, you know, $2 million plus properties. So looking at them, so looking at opportunities. He came back to me on the next call and he was like, oh my God, my mindset's changed. I've had, a, I've had like a paradigm shift with my mindset. I'm thinking it's expanded. And he said, you know what? Besides setting up a business that's going to be attractive to my daughters, I believe I, I could have an impact on the region. So this was three years ago. And I was like, man, go for it. Like, have a crack. Like, if you can do something positive, maybe build a development, a conference center that brings people in, brings money into the community. You can, you can yeah. do things, right? Limited by your imagination alone. So, yesterday I'm talking to him. He's the guy that got this government grant for 1.9 million bucks. Spent mm-hmm. 320 hours doing the um, application, um, bureaucratic red tape, and uh, worked out the 5,900 bucks an hour, him and his team. Anyway, it's like winning the loss, out, right? It's great. And he was reading out the specifics. I was like, so tell me a bit more about, because uh, these parameters, they have to do a development and then lease it out to certain people. And there was parameters mm-hmm. around who that's been leased out to. And it was these have to be people that have the ability to ba 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 and has a positive impact on the region. And I was like, no way, man. I said, hey, you, you've fucking said those words to me three years ago. You want to have an impact on the region, right? And it was, you know, paraphrasing now, but, and I, I'm like, you've, you've, made that happen now people talk about like he's attracted that he's manifested that you know there's that book the secret but he worked his ass off to make that happen and he set that intention first and then he worked and he got that and he looked at me and i was expecting him to say yeah yeah i remember that wow that's you know and i've just been listening to mel robbins when i was at the gym yesterday morning and she's talking about setting your reticular activating system like you buy a coin you see more of them that's why it's important to set goals and you activate your subconscious to work with you to start seeking out things that are going to take you towards where you want to go. And he said to me, hey, Kurt, I was, this is yesterday, right? I was hot off the press. He goes, when I was 16, we used to drive past this lot and I would, I would look out. He remembers being in the car, right, of his parents are looking out and going, I want to build a house there. I want mm-hmm. to build a house on this piece of land. He's just got the plans done for a house that he's going to build. And I'm not kidding you, it's 200 meters from that location. So he was, and I'm like, man, you've got that that ability. And there's, I was speaking to another guy today. Mm-hmm. He's got a similar story where he's set his intention. He's gone after it. I was telling him the story mm-hmm. about this guy, and he said, "Hey, well, my wife and I, you know, we found our vision board in the garage, and um, we're looking at it. And we're like, Bora Bora Land Cruiser. Yeah, we've done all these things, right? Yes. Yeah. And I was like, man, you, not everyone can do that. And the reason is. A lot of people do not obsess over their goals or what they want because they don't believe that they're worthy of achieving them. Right? And for whatever reason, like once you lock it in and if you go after it and you prepare to do the work, do the push-ups, like mm-hmm. it, you're gonna, it's going to happen. You're going to manifest it. So, um, you know, I've got endless stories like that, but that's, like, like I say, a very recent one. And it gives me gooses, man. I yeah. absolutely love it. That's why I love what I do. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome story. For any of our listeners out there that are maybe like starting out uh, in their building business, mm. do you have any recommendation on what they should do first? Definitely seek out some information. Yeah, you can start by inventing fire and trying to figure everything out for yourself, or you can, you know, follow in the footsteps of someone who's already done what you want to do. Mm. All right, success leaves clues. So you know. There's obviously good information out there. My, my book's one of them, right? Million Dollar Builder. It's on Amazon. It's on Audible. I'll send you a free copy. So I'd recommend you do that. Check that out. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be my book or us, although ours is one of the best. Um, fundamental. It's going to fast track your success. Like I've told you 
you know, just a moment ago, there's four people that have gone into the seven figure club within you know three years of starting their business. If you want to plod along and and you know go about it the long, difficult, hard way, then do that. Trying to figure it out for yourself, you don't need to. All right, we're living the uh, the best possible time to go into business because of the sharing of quality information and access to good people. Okay, that's it for this episode, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Next episode, we'll still dig into your 20 years experience as a business coach and we'll go through the foundations. Um, any good tips for any of you guys listening um, to our podcast? Sounds good, Carl White. See you then. Thank you.